folks, welcome back to another episode of the Retail Perch. And, you know, we've uh, kind of strayed a little bit from our promise of keeping everything purely retail. I guess last couple of episodes, we spoke to Sterling Hawkins, uh, talking about his book release, which I thought was fantastic, Gary. So, yeah, but, uh, this time we're back on track, talking about more retail, cool stuff, futuristic stuff, which is now the present. So, uh, right. yeah. So, and I know uh, most of, I hope most of the folks out there had a, Happy Fourth of July! Watch some fireworks and did some barbecues, but uh, we're back here cooking up some new stories with our new guests. <laughs> Anything to add, Gary? Before we get started? Uh, no, uh, looking forward to uh, uh, talking with Arson here today and learning more about this tech. Yes, so Arson, welcome and uh, welcome to the Retail Perch. And you know, most of our guests, just just uh, most of our. Uh, Listeners here tend to be uh, mostly uh, retail folks, you know, either they're running retail stores or tend to be solution providers, a few analysts here and there. So really try to get them the breadth of, you know, all the different technologies that go into making retail happen. And obviously you like to talk about some of the new stuff that's happening. And I read up your little bio and it's super interesting. So, but I, we want to hear it from your own words. So Thank, you can thanks. tell us a little bit about how you wound up doing what you're doing and what does Cooler Screens do? Well, thanks for having me, guys. Good good meeting you, Shekhar and Gary, and congrats on yours, all your success. And uh, uh, and so I'm excited to be here. Great. So, so if you uh, might, don't, don't mind getting started on your uh, story, you know, tell us where do you come from? How do you wind up doing what you're doing? And uh, prompted you to start my, my story is much simpler than everything else i think here uh, uh, I, uh one i came from uh, armenian 26 years ago so that's kind of like a, a, a typical immigrant entrepreneur story but i was i got lucky to come here for business school and a scholarship and from there just one thing builds to another but my professional story is very simple i i summarize it in the past, I said I went from IT to T and now back to IT. So the the so a computer science engineer by education, by background, came for business school, as I mentioned, and first startup uh, in tech, the working for management consulting, then going to work for I2 Technologies, you probably recall a, a big supply chain management. Uh, they got later acquired into uh, through multiple ways into JDA, Blue Yonder, etc. So uh, the, 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 that company had its own evolution, but learned uh, a lot about uh, the tech in retail and and some of those challenges from the back end perspective, if you will. I don't know what came upon me when the uh, in 2002, 2003, as the dot com bubble is bursting. I had the naive point of view that the technology is of as of Disneyland, it's all going to go away. And, and I wanted to be an entrepreneur again. So I uh, started a consumer brand called Argo, Argo Tea. If you are tea drinkers, you, you probably know. Grew that to just under $100 million business and sold it uh, in 2017 and started uh, Cooler Screens. And that's why I joke, I say I went from IT to tea and now back to IT to tech. Uh, so that's the nice. sh sh short personal background. That's so, a big uh, jump from T to cooler screen. Yeah, really. So, so tell us a bit about cooler screens and you know what what you do and, and how you got into that coming from uh, T. Well, uh, you know, if it wasn't for T, I don't think there will be cooler screens because building a brand, uh, a consumer brand, right? Uh, if I tell you guys, I spent ten thousand hours in, in the aisles of the stores like Kroger or 7-Eleven or Walgreens or Walmart, that'll be an understatement. And standing in those aisles, uh, you get to see a lot of things, you observe. And by, by nature, I guess I, I like to talk to people, I like to ask them questions. And, uh, and one of the observations was uh, uh, consumers, shoppers would walk in, and I'm sure you guys have seen this, they come in and the first thing they do, they pull out their personal cell phones and they're now starting to look up something while they're standing in a shop uh, deciding what to pick up. So I was always very curious as like, what's going on? What is it that they're trying to do on their phone while they're standing, let's say in front of a cooler door where the teas would be? Uh, and obviously I'm in the iced tea aisle, right? I'm trying to scratch my head, figuring out how to sell more tea competing against Coke and Lipton and everyone else. 
And and as I, uh, I'm I'm six four, big creepy guy coming up to the consumer saying, "Hey, can I ask you a question?" Right. So the, those were the funny moments of the entrepreneurship. I, I get to hear a lot of folks tell me consistently that what they're looking up online while they're in the store is very basic a lot of times. Hey, I'm looking up how many calories are in this product, how much sugar, or does it have this allergen in it? Uh, interestingly, as you uh, uh, now with more professional product research, right, as we started to understand the other parts of the store, you realize there is such a gap in that information need to make a comfortable purchasing decision uh, across m essentially almost every category. Uh, you go into the pharmacy aisle, you see a lot of people uh, are trying to understand what's the basic difference between Advil versus Aleve. They're trying to uh, decide, uh, can they afford a certain medication if it's FSA covered or Medicare covered, right? You go to the beauty section and you see that people actually are trying to find some ways of have a virtual try on uh, uh, so they can determine, I guess, I don't know if that lipstick is for them or not, right? Or uh, so, uh, so, so this uh, basic need that I call now CX gap, consumer experience gap was pretty obvious that people got so accustomed to the availability of information that made them confident when they buy things online. But yet when they're in a physical brick and mortar, a lot of this, what we think is pretty basic transparency that is required is not there. And that led uh, uh, to kind of, it spurred the first part of kind of my thinking about cooler screens concept, right? At that, uh, at that time, which is, is there a way to bring the best of these online shopping technology capabilities inside the physical store in such a seamless way where I'm augmenting, and I know augmenting is a buzzword uh, uh, in, in tech, but I use the word because it's really not trying to replace the, the physical, but we're trying to enhance it. We're trying to augment it in a way that digital and physical together give you this perfect experience. So that was, I would say, the founding uh, uh, first uh, kind of a big aha. But then it's, uh, uh, of course, there is a lot of devils in the details on how you get this done. And the second aha, uh, just to complete the story for you guys, was as a brand owner and a sub scale, right? We're not the big multi-billion dollar tea company. I could never compete against the big boys that were on that aisle, in that aisle on those shelves. Uh, uh, Pepsi's and Lipton's, they could always outspend us on the, whether it's the TVs or even Facebook's and Google's. So what marketers refer a lot of times as a top of the funnel uh, marketing, I knew that it's a game. If I get into it, I'll run out of money before I know it and I'll never get to the finish line here. So, but what I knew that uh, while I have to keep building my brand as an entrepreneur, as a, like I said, a subscale brand, a challenger brand, I have to win on a shelf so I can pay the bills. I can't just afford building a brand and not pay the bills. And so driving performance at that shelf was very important. And, 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 and what was available for me in the toolkit of marketing, call it activations at the shelf, was all coming down to this analog. He's a paper sticker. He's a... Uh, is, is, is uh, all these labels and all this analog world, which is like, gosh, this is 2000 at that time, 17, 18. What happened? Well, how come technology didn't arrive in store? So, 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 so that kind of, I think the intersections of a pain point I observed with the consumer, the real pain point uh, that I validated uh, through, all, through those numerous uh, conversations initially and then for professional research, overlaid with me putting my money where my mouth is every day and fighting on that shelf for survival as a, as a consumer challenger brand and understanding that I don't have any digital tools available in store, that, that pain point was me as a brand manager, if you will. Right. That, that intersection led to, I can, maybe there is a better way. Maybe this, uh, call it the ugly surface with the, that's covering the products in the coolers. At least that's the section I understood the best initially, the beverages with the condensation dripping and hiding the products behind it. The, those products may or may not be on the right spot. Uh, not uh, the best you have is the Mylar paper tag 
uh, with the abbreviated uh, that you have to decipher what really it says, what the name of the product is with uh, yeah. maybe a TPR uh, pr promotional pricing being in uh, in code or current or not, right? You kind of, it's, it's, it's a fun and analog experience. Anyway, so all that is why cooler screens. Hmm. Yeah. That is, that's, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think you're, you're hitting on something that's interesting, which is people get used to stuff used to experience and they don't know that there's a better experience out there right until somebody comes by and shows them that there can be a better experience and i guess you you saw the need for a better experience and you know very often people don't ask for stuff that they don't know they can ask for <laughs> right and i guess yeah, it's like I, a classic case but I, I but i've seen see screens like this years ago uh you know people attempting to do this i don't know gary remember we went down to west rock in north carolina and we, we saw some in their lab and looked fantastic. My only question was, how do you make this scalable? How do you make this affordable for retailers right. to actually install in the store? So how did you do that? No, I mean, uh, look, I think uh, uh, everything has to mature both as a problem statement, right? People, I think, need to see. They may not know that, that there is a solution to it. And you got, but they probably uh, kind of accept, as you said, the reality. That's just how things are. And then all of a sudden, they, uh, you know, all the, I guess, uh, and it'll be flattering for me to say, but all the big innovations that show up out there, and they they break those uh, conventions, and 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 people uh, look back uh, afterwards and they say, well, that was inevitable. That was kind of the obvious, right? Um, but to make it. Uh, inevitable and make it obvious, you got to make it seamless. And the uh, seamlessness is, uh, was not maybe quite ready in the past because technologies were not mature. E-commerce was, uh, first of all, e-commerce, I think really took off probably for the food and beverage during the COVID years, which made this even more obvious. And now the fact of life uh, still states that people like to shop in physical stores, 85, 90%, right? Stating the numbers everybody pop, uh, kind of um, uh, were recording uh, in the past 12 months. So the business is in stores. People now have come back with this heightened expectations of what online could give them, but nobody wants to pay that maybe 20, 30% markups for the Instacarts of the world, right? And they also, uh, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. I'm not clicking and tapping and waiting for even 20 minutes, assuming somebody could make money on that to deliver that thing to me. I want ice cream, it's hot outside. I'm just gonna go to my local 7-Eleven or Circle K and pick up my ice cream. Yeah. Or I'm thirsty. So I think consumer had to get to this point uh, through the natural evolution, first and foremost. And then an enabling technology needed to become uh, available and accessible to make it seamless for them. Um, and I mean, simply said, I refer to our smart screens as kind of lovingly as the giant iPad. Now, I wish I invented the iPad. I didn't. Uh, much, uh, much smarter and more creative people did. But we looked at this and said, if the iPad could be the surface in our palm of a human hand, why can't a giant iPad, with, frankly, a lot more computing and sophisticated capabilities in it, uh, be placed into a store environment? where it can do all of this uh, digital merchandising media capabilities that online we see every day, but in a physical world is not available. So, so I'm a beneficiary of the problem maturing uh, and the expectation becoming uh, real for the solution. And then two, I think combination of uh, uh, the the technologies in computing, in IoT, all these things, the buzzwords that are out there have become real. And we just, uh, in some ways, have to bring the ingenuity of putting it all together. Yeah. So I, I love, you know, like the, the graphic in back of you, you know, the, the, your ability to create a digital representation or duplicate of, of the physical shelves behind the door uh, makes it so easy for a shopper to find the products they're looking for. Uh, and I, I know you've got the ability to put, you know, ads or promotions on the screen. Uh, what about additional information? Like a few minutes ago, you referenced uh, you nutritional information, that type thing. Is that available? Uh, 
Yeah, the nutrition, um, and, and we looked at this as a roadmap. We said, as you start opening up these new layers, because you also don't want to overwhelm the consumer day one. And you don't want them to think that this is an iPad I got to be staring at and playing. The consumer comes to a store to buy. So the last thing I want to do is get on the way of that uh, and have them essentially turn into a, a, a digital uh, you know, reader versus turn right. them into a shopper. So so we brought the kind of a basic e-commerce like thought process of a conversion funnel. And yeah. we said, our job is to bring more people to the aisles where we bring the screens. Our job is to get them engaged with what they care about and figuring out the AI behind the scenes that uh, figures out what would be relevant for that consumer and do it with without knowing who they are, which is the privacy by design. Uh, uh, we call it identity blind uh, concept. And then convert them into a transaction, which is I got to make the, the sale close so the retailer makes money. And if the retailer makes money, the brands make money. And if the brands make money, then I just created a marketplace. I can go back to the brands and I can tell them I'm just giving you what, in my opinion, is truly the retail media definition should be, which is now I'm giving you an ability to connect with the shoppers at the point of sale at the right time and in the right mindset when they are in the intent and the context, all those buzzwords. Um, so yeah, we have these native contextually relevant um, uh, uh, digital moments incorporated into the screens yeah. where you could think that next, let's just say tea analogy. Uh, there is a little label popping up and it says I'm organic and I'm locally brewed. Well, that, that to you as a consumer, that's a great information because maybe I'm an organic buyer or I want to support the local brands. But to us and to the brand, that's a promotional opportunity. Right. And, and, and so, so by creating almost this democratizing the marketing at the shelf for all the brands to participate, that back to your question, uh, Shekhar, earlier about how do you afford, how do you make this work, kind of a business model. If everybody is able to participate in it versus only the big boys, you now have a marketplace. And, and, and that creates what is known today a retail media business. Um, but the core of technology is not, it's, I mean, yes, there is an advertising here, of course, right? That's what pays. But the core of technology, it's a digital merchandising, education, communication platform, which hmm which wins the hearts, I say, my business model, when I talk internally, I say, let's win the hearts of consumers. By winning the hearts of consumers, they will, we will earn their trust and access to their eyeballs. And then we will monetize that with, without breaking that trust, whether it's on a privacy or a content that's, not, uh, that's relevant. I mean, it, has, it can be an annoying content. So, so to provide that relevant content, are you using, you know, camera or computer vision, uh, you know, certainly keeping the shopper anonymous, but knowing that it's a male or a female, certain age, demographic, et cetera? No, so the camera is the gray area, Gary. And when you get into the world of a vision AI and, and the privacy, uh, I was, uh, uh, when I started to kind of think about what are the pieces of a puzzle in the tech, uh, I realized quickly that while, uh, while you can legally be all clear, but the consumers don't simply don't trust cameras when they see them. So I needed to have a different answer, which would then give me 100% privacy by design, like a, 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 which is by the way, is a framework. It's the foundation of GDPR in Europe and hopefully one day soon here in the federal, uh, legislation. So we brought in IoT sensors, with a number of them, that allowed us to create proxy for every signal that you would normally collect on a website. If you go on a t.com uh, or on Amazon or Instacart to the T page, you know the intent. Well, we know where you're standing. So we needed to put uh, laser time, time of flight sensors that would tell us uh, that there is a consumer standing in front of the T door. So we know the proximity. We then we would say, well, how many seconds you're on that web page, right? Which today e-commerce guys do all day long. You're, you're spending yeah. three seconds or five seconds. Well, we would measure their their dwell time. We would now monitor the shopper in front of the T door. We know that it's three seconds. 
then we would know that uh, if they're clicking in, in, online here, they're opening a door. They're, you're yeah. putting the product in your shopping basket. Well, we see from the back because on the back, we would have the, on the back of the screens, we would have cameras looking at the product and inventory planograms and the uh, out of stock condition on the shelf. We would know the purchase take rates, where it's like putting a, a product in a cart. Hmm. And then when you check out at the uh, register, uh, at Kroger, we get that data in a partnership with our retailers, and we know that you just checked out with that basket. So we essentially created, a, we mimicked a proxy of every data signal that's uh, that's collected in an e-commerce world, but we, we replicated that in a physical world using these IoT sensors. And we did that with no need to ever know who that shopper is, but we know what they've done, what what they paid attention to, and we know the context of that purchase. It's 3 p.m., it's 90 degrees outside, and you're spending more than, let's say, three seconds dwell time in front of the ice cream door. The, the, all the ML and RL models that we would have running on the, each screen, that's what makes it smart. They start learning that, hey, it's, I, I know it's a, it's a simple example, it's a no-brainer, but if you're spending more time, more than three seconds in hot weather in front of ice cream door, you're probably not there to pick up a frozen pizza. Right. And, and certainly nobody's going to Kroger or Walgreens just to have fun staring at screens, right? They're going there to shop. So the intent and the context yeah. became the main data signals that we process in these basically data models or AI models that are constantly running on each screen hmm. and this data graph uh, of multitude of these signals keeps finding uh, those moments where hey that content appears to convert people to more transactions yeah and in everything i just described i didn't really care what was your ip address was that Gary or was it uh, Christina, right? I, I, the, the, the algorithm, the tech does simply doesn't care. Right. Hmm. Neat. Cool. Yeah. So uh, let's get down a little bit more. So, so these screens that you have, and I'm trying to describe it to people who are not watching this YouTube video, they're simply on an audio podcast. So these are like screens that you, they would replace the door essentially on the, on a beverage shelf right in a we apply them on the or existing or... surface so okay. we don't take the doors off because as you know the doors uh, i mean we started in a cooler freezer aisle for the right. reasons i described earlier uh, i understood the space a lot of brands that had the problem and so on and so on but um the, the door also serves as a food protection uh, for the temperature as somebody right. said right you don't want your ice cream to melt and you don't yeah, want yeah, your yeah. natural product to go bad a lot of the technologies we work with, uh, whether it's, you know, with the big companies like Foxconn's in, of the world that make the iPhones or, or the people in the United States that make the doors, uh, uh, we worked on figuring out how to seamlessly, essentially attach this big giant, super thin iPad with all right. these computers and sensors on the surface of the door so that to you, it looks like nothing changed. But Got the door it. is. And still these are there. obviously touch sensitive, I'm guessing. We tried that, Shekhar. It's a great question. Customers want uh, intuitively, they are all trained to want to touch. But then we did the test uh, in one store in, uh, in, uh, in, in doing reading uh, in uh, Manhattan. And we quickly learned that touch was the wrong way of thinking about it, of a digital in a physical. I tell you what, what, it, what we learned. Uh, people like, hey, this one customer is turning this into a, essentially a iPad and they're hogging the screen. But somebody behind it says, kid, get off the screen. I need to just simply open and grab my bottle of water, get on the MTA right. to, to take the train to work. Yeah. Right. So, And this was the uh, early days, simple, but uh, to me, aha moment that computing devices like our phones were all and laptops were all optimized for a one-to-one -one relationship one human, one screen. Right. But when you're in a physical store, now you got to figure out how to appeal to many. It's a one-to-many relationship. You got multiple shoppers. You go Sunday afternoon to, in Kroger, you'll have possibly 10, 15 people constantly buzzing in front of the beverage doors or frozen doors. 
So, so we had to figure out how to give people an interactivity without physical uh, touch, uh, like I said, hugging uh, uh, barrier, which frankly became later an advantage when COVID hit, right? Because nobody wanted to touch anything. So, so this is where from uh, uh, the voice capability like Alexa or Siri, you can talk to these screens, you can ask them about the products, uh, wayfinding, product information, things like that uh, to QR codes and uh, the proximity uh, sensors that your phone can essentially turn into that remote control, if you will, to the screen. Those were the ways we solved that interactivity, but not the touch, because we learned the touch had this other issue, which initially I didn't think of. Got it. So you're using some kind of NFC type technology to enable interaction. Yeah, NFCs, Bluetooth, uh, and the QR codes, and and the voice enabled, uh, where you you basically just can you wave your hand and you can activate the the the, the screen to start talking to you. Got it. Got it. That's cool. So so obviously I'm assuming that you have some centralized CMS type capability for the retailer to control with shows up on each screen you're tying up with a planogram of some sort there's a whole bunch of so what, what does it take to implement one of these things in a store if i want to change out a couple of doors is it a heavy lift or is it easy for retailers to do this? um so so yeah i, I mean the, the short answer is it's seamless uh, the sh super short answer. It's seamless for a retailer. We, uh, but the the software that uh, is there. I mean, we're, right now we have in a wild uh, over ten thousand screens, almost like eleven thousand screens, uh, and four x that number is getting installed over the next couple of years. That's already on the contract with the retailers, and so one we needed to figure out how to create uh, a, a truly when they say you know the tech companies say the distributed computing network. I mean, that's, this is probably, with no exaggeration, one of the largest IoT networks that exists in the United States. We have sophisticated NVIDIA compute modules running uh, across the whole country uh, in all of these locations, right? So, so, so each one of them are able to work almost independent, but also centralized. So you have a content management system, as you said, right? Uh, the, we call it uh, the, the kind of everything where, where allows us to integrate the planograms uh, into the system, the dynamic pricing, the t promotions, the TPRs, and then all the, the third-party data feeds, whether it's the nutrition data, ratings, reviews, or is it, uh, 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 I give you one other cool use case, Gary, you asked about the other information we can show to customers uh, with our partners at Kroger we're learning on a, how advanced they are in a lot of their data capabilities, as everyone knows. Uh, they have some phenomenal strategy around healthcare. They call food as a medicine. And they have been able to collect, uh, they call it opt-up scores. It's all on their website, uh, publicly available. Basically nutritional values uh, of all their ingredients down to a basket level data. So they understand as the biggest grocer of the country what we eat and drink and how healthy it is for us. And, and being able to educate consumers about the ingredients health index, if you will, or nutritional index. So all of these are these really cool, unique data sets that are all flowing into the centralized system, which then pushes and syndicates that into each screen, but then lets the AI models that are essentially sitting on uh, the, these data models, AI models, uh, that are sitting on every screen, constantly monitor what's happening with the context, like I said, daytime, weather, and many others, or the shopper behavior, their action, their motion, and, and dynamically decide what to show and when to show. So that's one kind of big part of the kind of, I guess, the software uh, magic. Uh, I call it, it's the salesforce.com, but for the retailers, right? That's what makes them more revenue here. That's what gives us the sales lifts. Uh, which just again, the kind of little bragging for an entrepreneur, we've been averaging four, five, six percent in average of incremental sales lifts for wow. the retailers. Uh, these are not numbers to, to, uh, to sneeze at, right? We all know how hard it is to fight for a quarter point. Sure. Uh, and then the second part was the ad platform, which is you, you, we, we needed to build a fairly sophisticated digital ad platform 
that uh, that could allow the brands and agencies to access all this digital inventory, this media inventory, in a way that they are used to, in a way that they know how to buy. And so, so, so that's where a lot of our investment continues to go, which is to build the capabilities for the PNGs or the Cokes of the world or the uh, agencies like WPPs and others, Omnicoms, to understand that this is a digital media but not on your tiny little screen in a person's head, but it's a blown up six foot screen. Yeah, I, you must be capturing just a massive amount of data uh, and, and what's you know happening inside the store in front of, uh, in front of those displays. Uh, I would yeah. imagine the uh, CPG brands are all over that. Yeah, and, and Gary, when you start overlaying that kind of uh, essentially telemetry data from that, you know, a foot away from your product type of information against real-time shelf information, all these things, yeah. and, and you overlay that against uh, third-party maybe data like uh, propensity scores, you can start getting into really advanced uh, uh, data modeling. Uh, uh, you can basically say, I, I know that in this particular trading zone, uh, DMA or market, I have uh, uh, the T market is supposed to be, I don't know, 10, but my products, I'm only uh, performing at, a, at six and there's another four to grab. And this four is gonna come from these segments. Maybe these are Hispanic 20 to 30 year old young people and, and, and they shop in these particular stores and they shop in the afternoon and so on and so on. You can get so granular here when you start dissecting this. It's just mind boggling. Uh, and this is why when we bring this to the brands and they see uh, sales lifts uh, when they advertise in a 30, 40, 50% of times levels, they're like, wow, I mean, I will do that all day long versus pissing away money on a billboard on a highway or, or on TV or on a Facebook ad. Sure. So, so what, where else does that technology go? And, and um, uh, you know, what I'm thinking of is, uh, you know, think back a couple, three, four years ago, uh, Kroger was talking about their smart shelf, you know, with the display. What was it? Maybe three, yeah. four inch display. Edge. under the shelf. They called it edge, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. C could you, and, you know, obviously they never really uh, went forward with that in a big way, but could your technology translate to that or extend to that type of use case? Uh, I, we think so, right? I think, uh, look, edge was really creative. Uh, it was just a little bit of head, uh, ahead of its time, maybe. And also the technology was probably uh, 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 a little bit clumsy, right? And I have a ton of respect to my partners at Kroger. Uh, it, it just, uh, there were a lot of friction points, let's, let's say with the technology. Yeah. Uh, I, we, we think that the end caps are a great opportunity. We think the checkout lane areas are a great opportunity where uh, frankly, there could be even the small coolers and we're implementing that with, with Kroger. But, uh, but in the, um, in the aisle, there are some other interesting dynamics happening, right? It doesn't have to be a tiny screen mounted on top. You also have dynamics of loss prevention. And, and this last, especially last 12, 24 months uh, with a lot of unrest happening in big cities, if you walk into the Walgreens or CVS's, uh, you're just ast 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 astounding to see how uh, the aisle is getting locked up, I call it. I mean, they're putting these ugly plexiglass doors and things, which, essentially is creating already a surface between a consumer and a product out of a necessity of a different problem. Yeah. So, so we're seeing brands and retailers uh, seeing that perhaps that could be a much more elegant way to solve that challenge. Um, and then finally, and this is probably a lot more futuristic, uh, kind of personally, I think uh, the labor challenges and uh, in this country are and, and I think globally are going to drive us further and further into micro robotics and I think it's quite possible that the stores of the future could end up uh, looking a lot more like giant vending machines right 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 yeah. you know what would be cool is um, Arsene if we could get a short video clip of your product I'm sure you have 
produce many videos that we can kind of add on to this. Uh, yeah, I mean, now. it's on my website. Uh, I can pull it up or you guys can pull it up, whichever you want. Yeah, yeah, I would love to incorporate this so people can actually get a sense of what this product is. I mean, I see your background. It's, 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 it's really cool. And I can see uh, the value of being able to, you know, I, I think one of the issues, again, you know, beyond just price, is just awareness of these people who care care about transparency. They care about local sustainability, and you know all those different things that have now become so important for people to know. Uh, and it's impossible to get that information on packaging. And you know most packaging is more eye candy than it is real information, right? Uh, it's it's designed. Yeah, I mean, I I saw this Shankar firsthand myself, right? I mean, you pull out. Uh, uh, you, you pull out the, uh, the, let's say, tea bottle. And the first thing I would see a consumer do, they turn the bottle and then they're squinting, trying to right. read this little tiny print to figure out something basic. Is yeah. it kosher? Is it uh, more than three grams of sugar? Whatever it is. Correct. And it shouldn't be that difficult. Right. But then That's you, right. Yeah. And, and then the, uh, you, we all know, right, um, customers that would walk around with the coupons that they clip from the bottom of the bas uh, shopping baskets. And then they are, they're walking around trying to find where is that coupon. I mean, all this becomes all of a sudden seamless. Correct. Correct. So oh. I, I do believe that, I mean, consumers, if they're, I mean, it's a kind of, a, I know it's a, it's a big words, but consumer advocacy is, is not just a, you know, a policy conversation or a high level statement. You got to translate that into what does that really mean? What do you do to make a consumer make a better choice, with, which either fits their budget or diet or some other health preference? And then you say, well, what does that mean in the outcomes? Well, people save more money. That's Walmart's mission. Uh, we give you better products, uh, good products at good value. We, we make your life better, right? Whatever is their slogan. Uh, some other people talk about better health outcomes. And, and as I said, like Kroger... I'm so impressed with their food as medicine uh, uh, strategy, which makes so much sense, right? As, uh, that you control, uh, uh, not control, but you can influence the ingredients that go into uh, people by educating them what they eat. And as a result, they can, we can be a much healthier uh, uh, country, as an example. So those are sent, sound sentimental, but I think that to me is the true north for me for cooler screens uh, like that's the problem i'm trying to solve but i believe that by solving that bigger uh, uh, problem i can create unique opportunities for the brands to lean in and and essentially pay for this uh, model um and it, so so i'm again win win the hearts of consumers uh, uh, that makes more money for retailers and the brands, and that gives uh, yeah, that kind of that flywheel uh, from there works. So, do you think the technology is at a point where it can service the full spectrum of retailers, which is like you know your mom and pop stores to you know your giant uh, Kroger two thousand store chains, or is it something that's reserved currently only for big chains? Check our, uh, the honest answer is I think I'm better built today and I'm, I'll tell you what I'm doing to, to, uh, to grow uh, and evolve uh, our tech. I'm better built today for big organized retailers where the planogram information is available, where their pricing data is cleaner, right? And again, do you find everything that, that don't, I mean, you're in the business, you know, the, the big retailers may not necessarily have their game together either, but but we learned and that there was one element that was very important in real life, right? The planogram compliance is, and, and the inventory availability, it can be very frustrating. Consumers come up and they see this beautiful presentation of what's supposed to be on a shelf, but it's not on the shelf. Yeah. Well, so, and you go to mom and pop shops, bodegas or small franchise owners of 7-Elevens, you might find that uh, whatever is the corporate planogram, there is no such a thing. They put whatever they got. And when you have supply chain problems like today, they'll put on the shelf whatever the distributor brought them today, that morning. So, so we're, we, we kind of found ourselves inadvertently um, being uh, 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 needing to make urgent and significant investment into full vision AI capability for uh, which, which kind of is the problem that the checkout lane guys, uh, like the Amazon Go guys are solving for. 
but I'm solving that problem now where I can now bring in real time ability to recognize what's on shelf, assuming that there is no big corporate feed from JDA or Spaceman or some of those sophisticated PDI, those kind of systems. So um, uh, we have some great uh, smaller convenience store partners like Chevron, hunted some store uh, uh, franchise owner in uh, Los Angeles market and GetGo, which is owned by Giant Eagle, right? Again, a smaller part of their business. So we're working with those partners, uh, essentially uh, becoming, so tech-wise, we're becoming more sophisticated to handle maybe less sophisticated, less established retailers. And, and, and I think that's where the scale will come on top of the big Walgreens and Kroger's. Got it. Uh, yeah, you know, that's, you know, as part of Birdseye, that's what we constantly run into, which is that, uh, you know, the bigger guys obviously have a better handle on data discipline and have cleaner data. So it's easier to implement some of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And the smaller guys, as much as they need these technologies to compete with the bigger guys, where they have a difficult time is with data discipline, right? It's, it's, uh, that's really what gets them at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. But the seamlessness of this, um, um, Shekhar, is uh, we learned that you got to make this so simple and intuitive. Like I said, I, I like the analogy of the software is like salesforce.com is the software that made it super simple for any enterprise or small business to uh, get its Salesforce to do better and bring more revenue in. We took that as a, a I guess, a, a, an aspiration on the right. software side. And we said, imagine a small gas station, one cashier working, right? And they got line of customers. And how do I make this such a no brainer where first of all, it takes me less than two minutes to swap a, or add a regular door with a digital door. And it connects through the 4G, 5G network. And that's it, the door comes to life. Yeah. Then it's, it's as simple as one or two taps of moving around your icons of a Coke bottle and typing is two ninety nine. If you don't have a, a feed from some sophisticated right. pricing system, to for them to build their own planogram on the door, and and magic of oh, how do I go and tell Cook uh, I want you to buy this banner ad? They don't have to right. deal with that. All I do is I write them a ref share check at, at the end of every month and say, here's what Cook spent with us. You get your half, and I get my half. Yeah. Got it. Neat. Oh, very, very neat. Very cool. So super interesting conversation. Again, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've been doing this podcast for a couple of years now. Uh, and I don't know, close to 75th, 80th episode. And we've run into so many different kinds of businesses and uh, innovations. And it's staggering the amount of technology that has to go in to make retail happen. I mean, it gives you a bigger appreciation of, you know, all the little pieces that have to come together to make the consumer's life easy and seamless. And this is she just another fantastic. I'm just thing. curious, Shekhar, Gary, you guys have such a unique uh, view, a uh, cross-section of all the retail tech, right? Do you find what at least I thought was, which is all the tech focused to date on the back end? Let me make your ops better, labor better, inventory better. It's almost like it was astounding to me that I didn't find anybody thinking, I don't, how do, how, let me make you more money. Let me make you more sales. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, and then frankly, it's not an easy problem. That's probably why not many people go after it. Right. So, yeah. No. And, you know, and, and I think, you know, consumer experience is ultimately, I think we're getting to the point where, um, you know, several podcasts ago, we talked about, you know, how, the whole cloud coming into being has made innovation much more accessible to the common person, right? Before you had to do something in computing, you had to get a data center, you had to get mm -hmm. racks, you had to get people to manage them before you could do anything, even you know, run a little program. And now you have access to football fields of servers and you can do what you right. want at will. So I think a lot of those changes have started to trickle down and people have started to take effect and i think you have more and more startups coming in with exactly your thought which is how do i improve the experience because now i don't have to worry about computing i don't have to worry about a lot of things that you used to be have to worry about right yeah but you're right i, I think uh you know and, and a lot of people 
would rather sell SaaS enterprise solutions, you know, than you know, try to impact millions of people in their shopping experience. Right? So yeah, yeah. I, I guess the way I would answer your question is, you know, I'm seeing more and more of blending or fusing together of the physical world of shopping and you know the digital world of shopping. And, uh, you know, you're right in the middle of that, right? It's, it's uh, digitizing the entire store uh, and uh, the shopping experience. And, you know, Cooler Screens is a perfect example of that. Yeah, yeah. Very, 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 very cool. I mean, of course, we're, um, I think Stephanie is going to ask for your address so she can mail out a, uh, a retail perch mug to you. Oh, uh, well, now well. I'd like to send you a screen with the retail part hey, hey, mug on it. <laughs> I, 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 I always got a tea, a tea in my hand when I, when, there you go. When now I'm going to get you a yeah. cool mug. Now I'm wondering if we can actually send you a screen with the retail perch mug on it without sending you the mug. <laughs> <laughs> Put a screen on the mug. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Now, now, be... now you guys are shorting me. Here we go. Nah, no, no, no. This has been a great conversation. I mean, uh, very eye opening. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will be like, you know, I think they feel that it's futuristic. And I don't think many people know that it's actually here, you know. And I think people have seen prototypes and maybe a little short YouTube videos and stuff like that. But you're saying but, you're in 11,000, you have 11,000 screens deployed and well, another 44,000 or 50,000 due to go out in the next couple of years. That's fantastic. Yeah, we, I mean, it, 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 I mean, we can roll out a lot of stores uh, 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 quickly. I mean, there is capacity, right? My, my ambition, I guess, and a dream was if this is going to work, it has to, it, it only frankly works at scale. You cannot right. turn this into a niche Correct. thing because because right. the media, uh, the brands uh, need to move the needle, uh, and they right. so, so, so with with kind of that, uh, I hope not entrepreneurial arrogance, but more of an ambition, right? We went to the big boys and we said, "Give us a shot. Let us earn your trust with pilots." But but these are longer sales cycles with the bigger companies, of course. Yeah. So and that's why, uh, Shekhar, to your earlier point, we're starting to see that while we are working and learning with this big Krogers of the world. We have to partner with now small, medium-sized uh, retailers. I mean, just you take the gas station as a convenience store industry, 140 some thousand C stores yeah. in this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's massive. just yeah, it's massive. And you take Circle K, which is my current partner. We just rolled out actually Circle K last week uh, on July 1st on Friday. Uh, it was a memorable day for us. Uh, but you take the big boys, 7-Eleven, Circle K out. Everyone else is a small, medium-sized guy, essentially. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, it's been a fascinating conversation, and I know that uh, you know for some of you guys who've been listening to our podcast, this is maybe longer than a normal episode, but it is so because it is, I think, transformative in many ways and from an experience perspective. So, Arsen, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, I guess if thank people you. want to find you, they just go to CoolerScreens.com and. Uh, yeah, coolerscreens.com. My, my email is no secret, arson, A-R-S-E-N, right. at coolerscreens.com. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm available for any customer, any partner. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Gary. Any closing thoughts? Or? No, arson, cool stuff. Thanks for being with us today. Well, cool stuff with cooler screens, right? So, all right. You have thank a great you. week, and thank you again for being on the retail. You first. too. Have a great Talk rest of the week. Yeah, bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Make sure to join us every Monday and connect with us at The Retail Perch on Instagram and Facebook. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at theretailperch at birdseye.com. Until next time, this is Shaker. And this is Gary, signing off. <laughs>